So, well, my, my first question is, uh, you, you came from that environment yeah. uh, and uh, the issue of chemical dependency yeah. and uh, treating the problem as an illness. Mm. Uh, do you, uh, how, how do you deal with that issue uh, in your approach, the chemical dependency, the fact that uh, some people, do you, would you say that some people are more prone to uh, develop that drinking problem and uh, do you approach, uh, do, do, you, do you distinguish at all in that sense? that uh, it's, uh, it's somebody for whom the problem is easier to overcome because he doesn't have some kind of physical uh, uh, physical prerequisite to develop that problem or do you not see that uh, at all? Well, I say typically that I'm agnostic about the method of treatment. That what matters is, does it engage the person in some useful activities Mm -hmm. aimed at achieving the goals that they set for themselves mm -hmm. in this process of therapy. So whether or not there is such a thing as an illness or chemical dependency, these I think perhaps are important discussions but not in the room with someone mm -hmm. seeking my help. Mm -hmm. I'm usually saying, what is it you want and do you find what I'm suggesting of interest. Does it make sense to you? Do you think you can do it outside of the room? Mm -hmm. Because all of these ideas have no value whatsoever if they make no sense to the consumer and it doesn't help them ultimately. Mm -hmm. So this was a struggle for me in the beginning because the field had an explanation for both success and failure. Mm -hmm. If the client succeeded, it was because of our brilliant treatment. Mm -hmm. If they didn't, it was because they weren't ready for treatment or they were in denial. Mm -hmm. This seemed unfair to me. Mm -hmm. You mean nothing had anything to do with the therapist or the mm -hmm. treater? They didn't need to change? And so I see myself and I see our work as saying, let's be servants of our clients, mm -hmm. not masters. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, if... Uh this book or this approach you started uh, some 20 years ago yeah. or something like that. Uh, have you faced a lot of ostracism and a lot of criticism or and has that changed until now? Do you, do you see uh, the approach of medical field or the people in the medical field or the Alcoholics Anonymous uh, sphere, does that change now? Or? In the US the field has changed dramatically and I think when we wrote the book we had much less choice and diversity. Now there's a great deal of diversity and it isn't that we don't need AA or the 12-step approach. I've, many of the people I've worked with have found that amazingly helpful. Mm -hmm. The problem is, as the old saying goes, when all you have is a hammer, everything mm -hmm. looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. And not all people are the same. Mm -hmm. So you need to have some choice mm -hmm. in, the, in the matter, something that engages that particular consumer. Mm -hmm. So I, I haven't found lots of resistance to the idea. Um, in fact, from professionals, real professionals, I mean folks in the field mm -hmm. who are working with clients every day, mm -hmm. I find them hungry for a new idea. Mm -hmm. Tell me anything I can use that would be helpful to my clients. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about people like me, who are presenters who may have a book to sell, then they stick more rigidly to their ideas. Mm -hmm. right. uh, but practitioners are a very pragmatic group mm -hmm. of people. Mm -hmm. So they, you see them opening their minds to... Very much to so. ...working different ways. Very them. much. I, I think the only thing that keeps a clinician's mind closed is an absence of knowledge about other mm -hmm. choices. Mm -hmm. And um, I spend my life on the road working mm -hmm. with clinicians and I feel hopeful generally after each mm -hmm. workshop because they sit and they really mm -hmm. want to learn something new to help that one person that they mm -hmm. came to the workshop to figure out how to be helpful to. Well, let's hope that, that that's going to start changing in Czech Republic too. Yeah. Uh, if I go more to the book, yeah. uh, the the opening miracle question yeah. is more to inspire sort of imagination, yeah. and, uh, and uh, there the the real work begin, and the the following questions are probably more important: mm -hmm. the who, where, uh, uh, how, 
just out of all these, uh, if I uh, think of people who are surrounded by, uh, in their environment, um, by uh, uh, people, other people with, uh, who, who support their, their pro drinking problem, that all their friends are drinking, maybe a family member is drinking, uh, you are asking who are you with uh, when you felt better, um, maybe there is one person, an old uh, aunt or somebody, uh, how would you say, how would you work with somebody who is really deeply in that socially, uh, in that problem, to how can they reconstruct uh, sort of their social environment, like all the, they would lose all their friends, uh, they would uh, you see what I'm trying to say, yeah. uh, like maybe let's say it's somebody over 40, yeah. it's hard to start new relationships yeah. if you've had this problem for 20 years, all yeah. your friends, maybe they don't have a problem, maybe some of them have the same problem, mm -hmm. but uh, let's say it's, a, it's an actor in a, uh, in a theater environment, everybody mm. drinks mm. and you have to cut off yourself from that environment, that, mm. that must be extremely hard. How, how do your clients well, deal with that, or how do you deal with well, that? The way, the way the story is told, the way the picture is painted here, really does make it sound almost um, unsolvable. Mm -hmm. But nothing happens always. This is a key principle of, of the book. And change has to start something with something very small. So I, I know many people who tell me the very same story or something mm -hmm. similar where the way the story is told, there isn't any possible solution to it. Mm -hmm. And I listen respectfully because I believe them. And then I simply ask, tell me about times when that's not happening. When you have a, a moment where there isn't this support for the drinking culture you've described. Or tell me the last time you felt supported by somebody in taking a different direction. Who was that in your life? So we're looking for small um, uh, embers that I can mm -hmm. blow on mm -hmm. and maybe ignite something different mm -hmm. with, the, with the client. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's called a brief therapy. Uh, yeah. Do you, uh, if you, if you can think of uh, clients who have a drinking problem or the problem drinkers, mm. uh, do you uh, have an average length of the therapy or? Yeah. What I, what I would say is this, and uh, in our research we, we know now that if a particular clinician using a specific approach is going to help you as the, the person seeking their help, that you should start to see some benefit sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. Meaning that if in two months of work you're not feeling any different or better, your family is not complaining any less about mm -hmm. you and your behavior, you probably want to ask your therapist to change directions or you may want to change your therapist. Mm -hmm. And that's simply because an absence of change early on may be a sign that mm. this particular method just doesn't fit you. Mm. And what we do not need is to compound failure with guilt. Mm -hmm. Not only am I failing as a person by not stopping drinking, but now I'm guilty that I couldn't do it right for my therapist. Mm. That's not going to be a useful sentiment for a person mm. to think. It's the clinician's job to engage you and to provide useful ideas. Mm -hmm. If they don't, there are so many other therapists mm -hmm. that you can connect right. with. Right. Another thing about the book when I was reading it was that uh, uh, it seemed that uh, the, the method or the process uh, can be very much applied to uh, other sorts of problems. Yeah. Uh, the, the specific uh, topic of the book is, is uh, problem drinking, but yeah. uh, you could as well just take it and write, uh, almost like take different case studies yeah. and, uh, and write it for uh, relationship problems or eating problems or, yeah. or any kind of other uh, sort of disorder. Yeah. Uh, does work with, uh, with problem drinkers differ? In, uh, is there something specific? For, uh, for them. Just or what the consumer of the service is complaining about. <laughs> That's the only difference. Okay. Really, 
these ideas can be applied to uh, solving any any particular problem mm -hmm. or complaint that that mm -hmm. person comes to see me about. Mm -hmm. So we wrote when we wrote this book, we wrote about drinking problems because that's where my work at the time was focused on. I had uh, finished a uh, post-doctoral training at a place where drinking was the major problem that brought people to care. Mm -hmm. I think the important message here is if you have a problem, don't wait. Mm -hmm. Go get professional help mm -hmm. and give it about eight weeks mm -hmm. and see does your professional actually mm -hmm. help you. Mm -hmm. The particular problem shouldn't be as important as mm -hmm. reaching out sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. And have you had readers of the book uh, come back to you or, or contact you saying, I read your book, book and it worked, or do you have some feedback uh, from the readers? I've had both. I've had people say, I've read the book and it's really helped us. I've had clinicians say they use the book in group therapy contexts, mm -hmm. uh, so people will read in a structured way the chapters, develop a plan to achieve sobriety for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've also had people write me and say, I've read this, but it didn't help me either. Mm -hmm. And so at the back, we say, this is just one idea. Mm -hmm. And there are many other useful ideas. So for example, um, there's the self-help process of AA. There are The more isolated a person is, the less connected they are with a, a community of people who are sober, the greater the chances of success when you're surrounded by people, this just mm -hmm. kind of makes logical sense really, mm -hmm. that have that as an agenda, that I'm, I don't need to drink in order to be, uh, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, have a fulfilling uh, life. Right. Um, so I've, I've, had, I've had both responses. And uh, I can't uh, totally get away from the topic of uh, today's workshop. Yeah. Uh, you've been talking about clinical excellence yeah. and uh, would you would you say that you are uh, error centric uh, yourself um, how do you deal with mistakes or failure have you have you experienced failure you know of um, course um, I would say no different than any other clinician mm -hmm. um, I, I can tell you that when I show videos of my work to an audience of clinicians when I show videos that contain errors and mistakes, mm -hmm. the audience is much more alive and engaged. And I think it's because they know this to be the case a lot of mm -hmm. the time, that they are struggling to make sense in an honest way of what their clients are saying, and they really are struggling, most of them, mm -hmm. in an honest way to be helpful. Are clinicians perfect? Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. The difference here is that when I'm not successful, I'm suggesting in this workshop, and in my own practice to shift that burden to me. It's mm. not the client's job mm. to, to get better. It's mm. my job to help them get better. It's not mm. their job to be engaged. It's my job to be engaging mm. uh, to them. And if I'm not, which I'm not always, then it's my job, mm. I feel ethically, mm. to help them find something else that mm. will be engaging and helpful to them. Mm. Well, I must say your book was very engaging and uh -huh. I hope it will be engaging enough for people who, I'm excited who will to see find it help in it. Published and, uh, here. I'm excited about it too. So, so thanks thank for everything you you've done much. to make it, uh, make it available here. Thank you and thank you for the interview. My pleasure. <laughs> and uh, have a good lunch. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> okay. Good. Thanks, thanks for this. No, oh, perhaps my pleasure. Are you planning any other book or you have um, We have, we have, um, this is, I think, my. This, I think, was my second book, mm -hmm. and I have eight mm -hmm. books available. Mm -hmm. We have a new book uh, that's coming out called Reach. Right. Uh, Reach, which is essentially this being published, the, yeah. the focusing on yeah. the the professionals. Yeah. And, yeah. Yes. and I did one other self-help book mm -hmm. um, called um, A Surfer's Guide. Right. Um, but you know, it's. Uh, surfer's guide. <laughs> a surfer's guide uh, to the good life. It's um, uh, I grew up in California and um, spent my youth surfing up and down the coast, mm -hmm. and so we use surfing as a as a metaphor, an analogy mm -hmm. to what you can do to to deal with issues and problems. Right. So it's a, it's not 
for it can apply, apply to Czech readers as well. It's not yeah, of course. About you know, surfing. as long as you're surfing here, you right? Know, okay. And understand the metaphor. And right. I think yeah, yeah, definitely. It's being used in a lot of um, uh, programs, adolescent, especially mm -hmm. with adolescent boys. Mm -hmm. um, I think traditionally, psychotherapy has. Um, and even more recently, psychotherapy has, uh, it's a very feminine style activity. Sit in a room and discuss your issues right, right, right. and be in touch. There's a f real feminine quality. I'm not against that. Right. That's what I do for a living. But men, I think, can be engaged in multiple ways with mm. activity, for example. Mm. Not just mm -hmm. this and this, but with action. Right. And the surfing book is an attempt to do that.